بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم ما بعد can we judge other muslims and what do we say about the statement iman is in my heart you don't know you can't judge me only allah can judge only god can judge as they say so a question was asked in regards to what is iman to ahl sunnati wal jamaa what does ahl sunnah believe regarding iman and what should we say to our brothers and sisters who are maybe involved in uh, a lot of sins for example shaving their beards for the for the men um the women who don't wear khimar or don't wear hijab at all the ones who smoke uh weed smoke marijuana or do drugs the ones who watch pornography the ones who do all the various uh forms uh of sin and they say hey brother or hey sister don't judge me iman is in my heart how how should we uh deal with that statement what is correct is that is that statement of theirs correct from our brothers and sisters that have this deficiency in iman does this illustrate a deficiency in iman uh, in what situations are we allowed to judge our brothers uh and sisters in islam what's very important for us to realize first and foremost we have to define what is iman to ahl sunnati wal jamaa and of course if it relates to the creed or the fiqh or the manners or anything regarding ahl sunnati wal jamaa then it comes from kitab illah wal sunnatu rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam that's how we take our understanding and the understanding of the sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala anhum ajma'in and the salaf of this umma allah yarhamuhum jami'an and first iman ta ahl sunnati wal jamaa as our sheikh illustrates iman يعتقد اهل السنه ان الايمان اعتقاد بالقلب وقول باللسان وعمل بالجوارح so this is imperative for us to understand this definition of what iman is اهل السنه والجماعه believes that iman or faith it is the the belief in the heart it is regarding the statements of the tongue and the deeds that we do on our limbs and for example just to make this clear before we get into all the nusus that for example some actions of course actions have different levels and they require different levels of iman and different beliefs and different actions are all a part of uh, the different levels of iman for example salat salat incorporates all three of those aspects because in salat <clears throat> when we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of course we have iman and niyyah in our heart we have the intention to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone we believe uh we're worshiping the only one who created the heavens and earth rabbil alamin the sustainer ar-razzaq al-hayyul al-qayyum and the one the only one worthy of worship all of these are actions of the heart in addition to that the salat also combines the other aspects of iman for example we make dhikr on our tongue we enter the salat with takbiratu al-ihram we say allahu akbar allah is the greatest and all the various dhikr sami allahu lima hamida rabbana wa lakal hamd you know all of these are dhikrs there are all ways of remembering allah and and supplication uh some of them involve supplication some of them are adhkar or or ways of of remembering allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those are on the tongue and as a faida in addition to that it's very important that when you pray that you also you move your lips and your tongue should be moving it's not necessary that the people around you hear you but you should be actually uttering uh those adhkar and you should not keep your lips closed and not uh as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when he prayed his beard they would see his beard 
uh, moving. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ was moving his lips and his tongue. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Otherwise, the ulama, they, des they describe that as um, hadith al-nafs. That this is just when a person, you know, is dealing with waswas or maybe they have an intention. It's as if they're supplicating, but they're not uttering it on their tongue. But it has, in order it to be ma'tabir and considered as a part of our prayer, it needs to be uttered. You need to utter those du'a and utter those adhkar. Mentioning your Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala and praising Him, tabarak wa ta'ala. And the third component of Iman, which is also reflected in the Salat, is of course the Amal bi Jawarih, meaning that you are doing actions with your limbs. You're doing sujood, you know, prostrating. You're making ruku', you're uh, coming up from your ruku'. You are sitting in between the sajdatain, the two uh, prostrations. You are, uh, all of those actions of the body that you're doing, you're raising your hands in takbir al haram and, and so forth. Those are all actions of the limbs. And all of those to Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah make up Iman. Allah, and what is the proof that those that Iman is comprised of those three components as we mentioned, that it's not sufficient to say Iman is in my heart only? Because there's going to be a reflection on your outward limbs as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said fi kitabi al karim, innamal mu'minun al ladina ida dhukira. إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجَلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَقَّلُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says في كتاب الكريم that verily the believers are those that when uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned their hearts become filled with fear and if the ayats or the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are recited upon them or to them that it increases their iman it increases their faith and upon their Lord they make tawakkul they uh, rely upon their Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala put their trust fully in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the affair of the mu'min this is the, sta the, the, the status and the level of those whose iman is strong. What we learn from this ayah, from this verse in the Quran, is that it shows us, it's evidence that iman, it increases. Because uh, in addition to those components that we mentioned, that iman is on the tongue, it's in the heart, and it's on the limbs, iman also increases and decreases. And this is, we're also going to learn from these texts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fi kitab al-kareem in surah al-Ali Imran, surah al-Ali Imran, qala subhana, alladhina qala lahum al-nas, inna al-nasa qad jama'u lakum, fakhshawhum, fazaaduhum imanin wa qalu hasbunullah wa ni'mal waqeel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says fi kitab al-kareem about the people uh, of iman, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, in this verse, that those uh, those believers unto whom the people, meaning the hypocrites, have said, verily the people, the pagans, have gathered against you. Therefore fear them. But it only increased them in iman or faith. And they said, Allah alone is sufficient for us. And He is the best disposer of affairs. So this shows us again that Ahla Iman, their hearts, even though the hypocrites came to, to deceive them and make them fearful so that they would be easily uh, D destroyed and they would give up on their iman. They actually, it actually increased them in iman. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making ifbat for us that iman increases. Iman increases with obedience to Allah and iman decreases with disobedience to Allah. So going back to that first issue, someone who shaves their beard for example, if one of our brothers is tested with this, for whatever reason he shaves his beard and he knows that it's, it's, it's wrong to shave his beard, then this shows this is a weakness in his iman. This shows that his iman is weak. 
That doesn't mean he's a disbeliever. That doesn't mean you can just call him a wicked, fasic sinner. But rather, he has some fisk. He has some sin. And that is outward disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But perhaps inside of his heart, the other aspects of Iman, he's stronger than the one who has the big beard and the short thobe. Because maybe the one with the big beard and short thobe, he could actually be a hypocrite in his heart. So you can't make a, a, a full determination by just their deeds alone in what is contained in their heart. Unless it is something that takes them out of the fold of Islam and the conditions for making takfir are there and the person is ahlan for making takfir. So going back to the, the, the issue at hand is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let us know that their iman was increased. So iman increases and it de decreases. It decreases with what? With disobedience to Allah. So the more sin we do, the more the less our iman, the more our iman decreases. For example, the sister that doesn't wear hijab, she wears jeans, she wears a tight shirt, whatever. Some of the sisters wear mini skirts. They go beyond the uh, tajawuz al-had. But when you, uh, you, you try to invite them back to good, sister, you know, you should cover Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, orders, orders the believing women to cover in the Quran and in, in the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's ample, there's ample evidence. Sister, you know, Brother, I don't want to hear that. You don't know what's in my heart. When she responds with this, this is her uttering from ignorance often that she doesn't realize and doesn't understand Iman. That this is a deficiency in her Iman. Why? Because she knows the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and she refuses it. Instead, she decides to go with her desires and what the trend is in her society or, or what, what have you and so forth. But this is a part of her Iman. This is a part of her outward appearance. And she's right. We don't know exactly what's in her heart. But it shows that there is a deficiency in her heart because all of those are components of Iman. And if the inside is good, the outside will be good as well. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in an authentic hadith, which shows us also that Iman is made up of those components and Iman fluctuates. Qala Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Al-Iman bid'un wa sab'un shu'ba a'laha qul la ilaha illallah wa adnaha amatata adha an tariq wa al-haya shu'ba min al-Iman. In this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Rabbi Wasallamu Alaihi said that Iman is uh, is uh, of 70, 70 parts. The highest of it is a statement La ilaha illallah because this, this is a type of remembrance of Allah and it's a ki kind of uh, it's the, the testimony of faith that enters one into Iman, enters one into the fold of Islam, enters one into Jannah, into paradise. So he said that the highest level of this Iman is the statement, La ilaha illallah. There is no God worthy of worship except Allah. وَأَدْنَاهَا أَمَاتَتَ أَذَانْ طَرِيقٍ He said, and the lowest of it is removing something from the road. So that means that's a part of Iman. That a part of Iman is simply doing an act if you see a thorn or something that's going to harm people's tires or something in the, in the path of the walkway, a stick that uh, someone could trip on or a rock or something. By removing that for the sake of Allah, this is a part of your Iman. You'll be rewarded by Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam described it as what? He described it as Iman. Letting us know that Iman is Qawl and Iman is also Amal. And then he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Wal Haya Min and Iman. And shyness is a part of Iman and shyness is, uh, can be possibly a, a physical but also it's an intrinsic action of the heart. That a person is shy. The person who has immense shyness. Uh, for example, when you see a lot of times the virgin women, the virgin believing women, or even non-believing, uh, even non-Muslim women, when they're, when they're a virgin and they're, they have this shyness, 
that they become embarrassed easy, easily about uh, certain issues and, and so forth. They're not outward like that. And this is a part of Iman when it relates to the believer. It's a part of Iman. Shyness is a part of Iman. So that illustrates for us those components. Another hadith which is incredibly important, which illustrates for us that this is evidence that Iman fluctuates and that Iman is also comprised of the heart, the tongue, and the actions of the limbs. The Prophet wasallam said in the hadith of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu qal sami'tu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi وسلم قال من راء منكم منكر فليغيره بيد فإن لم يستطيع فبلسانه فإن لم يستطع فبقلبه وذلك عدو فليمان رواه مسلم من الحديث of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم the hadith of Abi Sa'id al Khudri رضي الله تعالى عنه he said that the Prophet he heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم say whoever من راء منكم منكر whoever sees an evil then change it with his hand and if he is unable to do so then with his tongue. And if he is unable to do so, then with his heart, and that is the weakest of Iman. What's the, 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 the shahid or the main point here? Is that the Prophet ﷺ described all of those ways of commanding the good and forbidding the evil, or of forbidding the evil, as Iman. Meaning that Iman is comprised of what? It's comprised of the actions of the hand. Your, your limbs, it is comprised of the actions of the heart, so it's contained in your heart as well, of course. That's the asl of Iman. And it's also com comprised of uh, speak, uh, speaking, uh, the actions of the tongue as well, speaking. So all of those things are a part of Iman, and there's many other evidences from the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. And now to be to go in accordance with the minhaj in accordance with the way Ahl Sunnah sees the evidence, they go with the Quran as we mentioned, and then the Sunnah as we mentioned, and then they go to the Aqwal of the Salaf al -Sali. Let's hear some of the statements of the Salaf what they said about Iman. Here's the statement of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal rahimahullah Taala. Yukul Imam Ahmed al Iman qul wal amal yuzid wal yankus. Imam Ahmed said Iman or faith. It is. Uh, the statement of the tongue, and it is de uh, actions as well, al amal. And it increases and it decreases. And so, in that amal there that Imam Ahmed is talking about, is also included, of course, uh, amal of the heart. Because actually, the ulama, you'll find many different um, t Islamic terms when you go into the books of the Salaf. Uh, regarding these uh, principles of Aqidah and Iman and so forth. And sometimes the way we understand certain categories, it's the, the Salaf may have, for example, uh, Imam Ahmed only mentioned two of those parts of Iman. He mentioned the tongue and the, uh, he mentioned the tongue and he mentioned the deeds. And it's already implied and known from the statements of the Salaf that also they used to refer to it as Amal, uh, amal al Qalb, that deeds of the heart. So that is also lets us know that those, the actions of the heart, as, as so to speak, that those are, that's also contained in the, in the concept or the word amal that Imam Ahmed rahimahullah ta'ala used. Let's listen to the statement of Imam Abu Bakr al-Ajuri rahimahullah ta'ala who is ma'roof in his, one of the most uh, classical texts regarding uh, statements of the Salaf that's very imperative for every student of knowledge bi ta'ala to have. Of course, it's only in Arabic, but it's an uh, incredibly important source regarding the Aqidah of Ahl Sunnah. He said, he, he entitled one of the chapters, Bab al qul bi an al iman tasdik bil qalb wa ikrar bil lisan wa amal bil jawari wa la yakun mu'minin illa bi anna tajma' bi anna tajma'a fihi hadhihi al khasal al thalath. So this is a beautiful statement in his his the title of one of his chapters in in his book. It was called the chapter that statements of the tongue and uh you know, an affirmation or belief in the heart, and um, and deeds of uh, and deeds of the limbs are all a part of iman, and that 
a person is not a believer unless he combines all three of those parts of Iman. So that was the title of his chapter. And then from there he brought all kind of statements of the Salaf of this Ummah from Ahl Sunnati Wal Jama'ah regarding this. We'll take one last statement from one of the Salaf. <coughs> the statement of Hafiz Abu Bakr al-Ismaili fi was mu'takid Ahl Sunnah in his, his uh, description of, uh, of who Ahl Sunnah is. He says, وَيُقُولُونَ إِنَّ الْإِيمَانَ قَوْلٌ وَالْعَمَلٌ وَمَعْرِفَةٌ Yazid bi ta'a wa yanqus bi ma'asiyah. And this is as we said before. So Imam Abu Bakr Ismaili, he said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he said that uh, from the, when he was describing about Ahl Sunnah, what they believe in his book, he said that they say, meaning Ahl Sunnah, they say that Iman is statements of the tongue and it is deeds. And it is ma'rafa. He said ma'rafa, meaning uh, like an acknowledgement or knowledge, acknowledgement of iman in the heart. So that they, so it, so again, those three components are there. That iman is comprised of those three components. Then he said yuzid bi ta'a that it increases with obedience to Allah wa yamkus bi masia, and it decreases with masia. And the statements of the salaf, we could spend. <laughs> years reciting the, the various or uh, mentioning the various proofs from the Quran and Sunnah and that should be sufficient to let us know Iman is uh, comprised of those three components so it's not sufficient to say Iman's just in my heart and that Iman increases and it decreases let's look at something very important now with related to fisk and sinfulness Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah he said إِنَّ الْكُفْرَ وَالْفِسْقَ أحكام الشرعية ليس ذلك من الأحكام التي يستق يستقل بهذا العقل فالكافر من جعله الله ورسوله كافرا والفاسق من جعله الله ورسوله فاسقا كما أن المؤمن والمسلم من جعل الله ورسوله مؤمنا ومسلما. So Imam Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah رحمه الله تعالى he said in a very important statement he said that disbelief and fisk you know wicked sinfulness these are Sharia rulings meaning it's not for everyone to 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 make takfir of people or to call someone a fasik a, a, a wicked fasik and he said that this um, these are not uh, from the rulings which are derived just from, from, some, from the intellect that are separated from the intellect. He said, so, so a disbeliever is the one who Allah and His Messenger has made a disbeliever. And a fasik, you know, a wicked sinner, is the one who Allah and His Messenger have made of fusakh or you know people of sinfulness and wickedness similar to the way a believer and a muslim are those who Allah and his messenger have made believers and muslims so that's a, a very important statement for us that should give us insight to the things that we're uh, that we're dealing with and we're referring to. Now when it comes to talking about a particular individual, when it comes to the brother, for example, to give an example, the brother who shaves his beard and you've given him evidences and proofs from the Quran and the Sunnah, but he hasn't uh, he, but he refuses out of obstinacy. Or the sister, you've tried with her and you, you've given her the proofs from the Quran and the Sunnah, but she refuses it out of obstinance or, or what have you. Or whatever the sin, this person drinks alcohol, but they refuse to leave it uh, out of obstinacy. So what, what should we do? Do we have the right to uh, make tafsiq on this individual? This is, you know, to call them the, a wicked sinner. Now, of course, we know it is permissible. The ulama, uh, Imam Nawawi in Riyadh al-Salihin has written extensively about this. He has a chapter entitled about ghibah, when it's permissible to, or what are the permissible types of ghibah, so to speak. Because this is uh, what the, the salaf of this ummah, those especially Ahl hadith how they use, how they were able to discern whether someone was trustworthy or untrustworthy, whether they were an, a mu'tadi', someone who was an innovator, or 
uh, someone who was uh, from Ahl Sunnah, whether they were a disbeliever, they had uh, um, bid'ah mukaffara or bid'ah ghayr mukaffara. You know, the bid'ah that takes you out of the fold of Islam or the bid'ah that keeps you in the fold of Islam. It's just a wicked sin and it's innovation in the religion of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, the, there are times when it is permissible to speak about another Muslim and we'll just quickly talk about this and then we'll talk about the last aspect which is making a ruling upon someone. So, uh, Imam Noah we explained and many of the, the Ummah, these great Imams have left us a tarath, a, a treasure uh, of, of knowledge about these issues. These issues are not new issues. And one of the things that they mention, for example, if someone is going to uh, get married, for example, a brother comes to your community, he wants to marry one of the sisters in the community. And the sister wants to marry the brother, but the people are unaware of anything about the brother. So they ask someone from his community or they ask someone who knows him or what have you, they check on that. It is permissible, of course, for the person who knows something about that brother to share that with the sister and those people concerned. Especially if it is something regarding sinfulness and wickedness or, or bid'ah. Why? Because he is, by sharing that knowledge, they are protecting the community and they're protecting that sister that wants to uh, be to marry this brother. So that is one of the situations in the situation of marriage or in the situation where it requires n having knowledge about a particular individual. This e e brother is going to teach in the community or he's going to be an ima imam in a community. The people have a right to know about his aqidah, to know what he believes. Uh, does he have the creed of Ahl Sunnah or does he have the creed of, of, of some other group or sect which goes against the beliefs of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah? So it's important in these situations uh, that to know that there is a time of ghiba, so to speak, where it is permissible, where it is permissible to speak about others, to warn the community from the harm of individuals. And the ulama have written extensively in, about about these issues and about you know when it's permissible to make hajr, you know, to to uh, cut off an individual, not give them salams, or not uh, co cooperate with them in in in, in dawa or, or whatever the situation is. There's so many ahkam related to this, and the ulama of, of, of Islam have written extensively about it. And this is not the time or the place, but we just wanted a general idea about this. Now, what what do we do? when it comes to this particular sister or this particular brother, the sister that doesn't wear hijab, the brother who doesn't, who shaves his beard or he, he does some other sin openly and what have you. How do we deal with this? And, and, so, and uh, from another point uh, 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 of faida or benefit, also we have to remember that if someone is doing a sin, for example, you know about a particular brother or sister, for example, maybe they're tested with pornography. They they are uh, involved in in watching some you know evil and harmful things, or they they drink alcohol. But no one knows about their sin, and they are not being arrogant and outward about their sin. And it is not there's no ne ne need or necessity to tell people about their sin. Then in this situation, you should cover their sin, and you should go to them and give them advice, as the Prophet sallallahu said, "Ad Din Nasiha." That this religion is uh, is 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 Nasiha. It's clear advice. Uh, and, and that is the duty of the, the mu'min. That's ta'awun ala bir wa taqwa. And that's, that's helping and that's commanding the good and forbidding the evil. And that's cooperating in righteousness. So you should call your brother and sister away from that sin. But if they're doing something outward, it's outward. They're drinking alcohol and it's out at the club and everyone sees them. And they're drunk and they're fighting and they're, you know, they're, they're outward in their sin. Then, of course, in that situation, then uh, they've already publicize their sin. So if you're publicizing it for the sake of a Sharia benefit, not for the sake of belittling the person or the sake of making yourself 
seem better or for some some other to, to spread harm in the community or something. No, but you are doing it for Sharia benefit and there's the ulama speak extensively about when the maslaha the maslaha of these these situations. You know, if, if there's these people people present a harm to the community, it's necessary to speak about their sin, then of course you need to speak about it. But let's go to the crux of the matter here. And we'll just end by mentioning a statement of Sheikh Salib bin Fozan. So what about this particular individual, this brother or sister, who is arrogant, and we've advised them and we've advised them. Sheikh Salib bin Fozan said, uh, regarding, he said, لا ينبغي لطلبة المبتدئين وغيرهم من العامة أن يشتغلوا بتبديع وتفسيق So, Sheikh Salah bin Fuzan, he said, it's not permissible for beginning students of knowledge and other than them, from the general uh, Muslims, that they should busy themselves with making rulings of tabdi, you know, calling someone an innovator or calling someone a wicked fasik. لأن ذلك أمر خطير. He said because this is a a very serious and dangerous uh, issue. وهم ليس عندهم علم ودراية في هذا الموضوع. Because they don't have the the knowledge and the cognizance related to the to these issues to to this issue or these issues. وأيضا هذا يحدث العداوة وبغضاء بينهم. And also this increases or makes uh, enmity and hatred between them. And then so he said, فالواجب عليهم الاشتغال بطلب العلم وكفى السنتهم عما لا فايدة فيه بل فيه مضرة عليهم وعلى غيرهم. Beautiful, beautiful statement. If only we practice this from Allama uh, Salib bin Fuzan. He said, of course, that this creates enmity between the people. So we mentioned what? That it's a dangerous affair. It's not for the beginning students of knowledge. It's not for the general Muslims to be, to busy themselves with tabdi and tafsik. And also he's spoken extensively about takfir. Min baba ola. Takfir is taking a Muslim out of the fold of Islam. So first and foremost, takfir is included in there. That you should not, that is not our job to busy with calling people disbelievers and, and so forth. And wicked sinners and innovators if you don't have the knowledge and ability to do so. And he said, because it's a, a serious and dangerous affair, and it requires knowledge and cognizant of those issues, and it creates also, it creates enmity and hatred between the people. So he said it's an obligation to busy, uh, that, that they should busy themselves with seeking knowledge and restraining their tongues about those issues which there is no benefit in. He said, rather, there is harm upon them and harm on others. Beautiful, beautiful statement of Sheikh Salih bin Fuzan, Hafidhullah Ta'ala, that this is not our job. So when you see a situation like this about a particular individual, and you should advise them. Do your best, but be cautious about calling people innovators without having someone from Ahlul Ilm having preceded you in that. And be cautious about calling them wicked fasics. Even if you see, you know they're they're involved in fisk. But before you make that ahkam, meaning that you you go around and you speak about them, he's a wicked fasic. He's this. And if there's no benefit in, in doing so as well, then restrain your tongue and ask the people of knowledge about that particular individual. But give them a good sahih description. Don't distort the description to, to get a fatwa, to obtain a fatwa to suit your madhab or to suit your uh, minhaj or to suit your... Uh, your um, your desires or what have you, because this is another problem, and I'll, I'll end with this, is because we see some of our brothers and sisters, they call the ulama, and they distort, they they distort the picture of what's going on, for example, in America or what's going on in the UK or what's going on in Canada or what's going on in Holland or Indonesia or wherever, and they say, hey, Sheikh, we have a, a guy and he's like this and this and this and this. What's the ruling with that? So then, then the sheikh makes a ruling based upon what he's heard, and he's rewarded for that. 
Then they go back and then they apply that general fatwa to a specific situation. So you have to be very honest when trying to obtain fatwa and, and dealing with these affairs. But And also from the Bab of Faida, the ulama, they mention in one of the Qawaid Fiqiyah, one of the Fiqh principles, that when it comes to making fat- fatwa, that the the uh, the hukum for something hukum ala shay far'in and tasawwurihi that when you make a ruling on something it's necessary to have an accurate picture of it so don't just say we have this imam he's from ahl bid'ah okay this is your image you say is from Ahl al-Bid'ah instead of giving a good description who this imam is, what is he doing, is he pumping the sunnah out or is he distorting the principles of Aqidah and, 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 uh, and Ahl al-Sunnah and so forth. But you have to give an accurate picture so that the imam or the sheikh or the alam can give a proper hukum and proper ruling pertaining to the individual. And we ask Allah the Almighty to accept this good and forgive our evil and protect us from kulisu and makru. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad.